Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi, Martin. We're talking. We're continuing. Oh. Well, we actually thought that it... Uh, it would be two, but it turned out to be three, right? Yes, because the climate COP27 is actually two weeks full of everything, and there's a lot happening, so we can't brush aside some of the things that, had, that did happen. All right, so we need to talk about these things. And uh, hopefully, Martin, they will get on with it because really, this is becoming, uh, a good word would be nauseating. And what also happened is that a lot of people were, well, there was an expectancy building up now towards this. And everybody thought, oh, wow, so now this is going to be news, is going to be this new commandments that's been set out there, especially people that are waiting for prophetic fulfillment. Now, the interesting thing is the devil never works like that. Exactly. Because he always comes via a back door. He's not a front door man. He's a back door man. So that's why you have to, when these things happen, go and see in the back. What's happening behind the scenes? Exactly. Let's pray, Martin. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to work for you, and we ask that you please... Once again, enlighten our minds and to guide this discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. But before we start, yes. there's an announcement that we'd like to make. Oh, yes. We have recorded a special program, which we are working on, which we want to release in the WhatsApp Prof slot from the 22nd of December till the 12th of January. Mm. And then we will continue with the normal WhatsApp Prof series. So we're working on it and trying to get it ready. And by God's grace, we will have it ready. Yes, and it's an exciting one, so people must not miss. Yeah, it's the same. It's, it's the same. It's the same, but slightly but a different. Bit different. And so. some of the faces might change. Yeah. But uh, we'll come back to the original format after that. So I hope people will get a blessing out of it. So let's dive right into this. Now, while we're talking about climate repentance, climate religions, and 10 climate commandments, which, of course, are uh, necessarily vague, because that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Out of vagueness behind the scenes comes something totally different. It's also, if you read the portion in the Spirit of Prophecy, the Sunday law is making its way in, in darkness. In darkness. In other words, in secret. Exactly. A lot of things happening, but the main thing is happening behind the door. Well, Martin, our first one comes from a Jesuit source. They are relentless in their pursuit. They're probably sitting behind all of this in any case. Yes, they're keeping the door closed so that you can't see what's happening behind it. But they're so excited about what they're doing that they can't keep their mouths shut, right? And every now and then something slips, slips out. out. So, the Jesuit Review. Pope Francis calls on Christians to repent and modify our lifestyles to save the planet. You know, he should ask nature to repent as well. Because, as we said in the last one, one volcano, just the one that recently uh, exploded there or put emissions into the sky in Iceland, produced more CO2 than all humanity to combined could produce in four years. Mm. So one little volcanic eruption, and there are thousands, Martin, will set you back four years. So... I'm wondering whether he takes nature into account when he talks about nature, but that's not part of his agenda. No. So the ends justify the means. So what are the means that they are using to justify the ends? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you take what we've also said in the previous episode, this repentance, you repent towards Jesus for sins that you commit. Yes. You don't repent towards nature. It's paganism at the worst level. Exactly. And the, we've seen in that, the portion of that letter, brother, son, they're actually repenting towards Mother Earth. Yes. Which is totally pagan, like it's you just said. It's pathetic. 
So in his message for the World Day of Prayer for Creation, the Pope said the current climate crisis is a call for men and women, especially Christians. You know, Martin, it irritates me that they always put in an especially. Something is always especially for some target group. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we just all humanity? Why must you isolate one portion of humanity to the detriment of others? If, if a catastrophe strikes, mm. it is not selective. It is not selective. It strikes the rich. It strikes the poor. It strikes, the, strikes all the ethnic groups. We all suffer as a collective humanity. But this nonsense of especially taking out one yeah. group is absolutely horrendous, in my opinion. It's a plan, actually. It's if a you plan. think about it, because... They are the same people, not in, uh, only him, but everybody that shouts against racism or all of this, they actually are doing the same Correct. by doing this. So what is he saying by saying especially Christians? He's saying that is the group that is not playing ball. Exactly. That is the little group that must come into line. Mm -hmm. That is what he's saying by saying that. Or when he says the poor... Or when they talk about ethnicity or whatever. You know, you have Black Lives Matter and uh, Kanye, Kanye West said, said, no, White Lives Matter. There was a huge fora about, what about all lives matter? You know, this target grouping is to put you on a guilt trip. It's true. So but they, will, they will use guilt trips for all. As long as they can get mileage out of them. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. But if you take it, Israel had the same problem. They were also, and look where it got them. Your house is left to you desolate. It's left desolate. And it, it works like that in the political sphere. I don't want to go into politics. Mm. But let's take apartheid, for example. Mm. I grew up in the apartheid era. I was on both sides of the divide because I'm an old goat, right? But these young children that are born now, that have been born in the last generation, they had nothing to do with it. But they still bear the blame on both sides of the divide. The one is suffering and the other one is this and that and the other. And you have all kinds of laws. You know what? Mm. When can we finally realize that by one blood he created all of humanity? And the question is not... Do you belong to an ethnic group? Do you belong to a particular uh, religious system? Do you do this? Do you do that? But the question is, when will we realize that sin has come into the world and that the problem is sin? That's the problem. The basic that, problem behind everything. That is the cause. We're just treating symptoms the whole time. Now, which religion tells us what the cause of the issue is, mm. but provides the solution as well. Christianity. Only Christianity provides that solution. Therefore, Christianity must be a target. Mm. And the one who provides the solution must be marginalized because the others do not want to accept the solution. Yes, hmm? yes that's, that's right. what it is. So, Martin, even if you are a Christian, there are thousands of groups within Christianity. And even if you finally belong to the remnant, there are thousands of groups within the remnant. Mm -hmm. And no matter what issue you touch, whether it be diet or whether it be issues of salvation, never two will seem to agree on an issue. It's true. And it's a sad thing because... We have to get unity. Yes. So we must repent and modify our lifestyles and destructive systems. So that sounds to me like build back better. Oh, for sure. Yes. I think it's build back better. <laughs> Pope Francis said the Vatican's July 6 accession, and they always use this, mm. this terminology. Like you said previously, this is biblical terminology. Yes, they are kings. They have their accession. They have climbed upon the throne. In the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement was made in the hope, 
quote, that humanity of the 21st century will be remembered for having generously shouldered its grave responsibilities. Who's making this appeal? The one who has had the accession, who's become the king. The kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. Underlying all this, the Pope wrote, there is a need for a covenant between human beings and the environment. We have a covenant with God. I don't need a covenant with anyone else. Exactly. Because a covenant means two intelligent parties make a concord with each other. I cannot make an intelligent concord with the environment. No. Because it cannot speak, it doesn't have ears, it cannot talk, it cannot see, it cannot hear. So this is total paganism at its worst. Which for us believers is a mirror reflecting the creative love of God. So they twist it to bring in a pantheistic entity. But he's modernized because you're not talking to the environment. Exactly. And we've got a biblical term here as well. Mirror reflecting creative love of God. What is the mirror of the Bible? The commandments. Well, let's So now they that. want to change this. Let's have a look. From whom we come and towards whom we are journeying. From whom we come and towards whom we are journeying. Who's journeying? Now, when you journey, Martin, are you on a road? Yes. Can there be a narrow road and a broad road? Yes. Now, what does the Bible say? The majority is on the narrow road, right? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> the majority is on what road? On the broad. So, let's watch how we journey, right? All right. Obviously, we're not on the same page as the Jesuits, right? No. All right, here's another article from the tablet, 15 November 2022. Vatican tells. Well, I don't know, really have to go much further. What do you say about that? Vatican tells, COP27. The wound that is supposed or is going to be healed means that the beast will get his political power back. And right. this seems to me that the headlines these days as if the wound is basically healed. Now, what if it said there, Martin Smith tells <laughs> COP27? <laughs> would, <laughs> would, would there be any reaction whatsoever? <laughs> eh? No. No, none whatsoever, right? Or what if I tells COP27? No. Vatican tells COP27 that climate action can no longer be postponed. Did they tell that to the volcano that erupted in Iceland? Yeah, but you see the... Covenant with nature was not in place then. I see. So hopefully nature will respond. The Pope also promoted the Laudato Si action platform, which was set up to consolidate efforts to implement the Pope's 2015 encyclical on the care of our common home. Martin, are they absolutely adamant that his Laudato Si must be implemented? Yes. So everything that's written in there that he propagates. propagates to combat this climate change, they want to implement it. And obviously, we've mentioned it many times before, there's a certain law in there that, we, that will be implemented eventually, yes. a certain day. Yes. I encourage this crucial mission for the future of humanity so that it may foster in everyone a concrete commitment to care for creation, he said. The film, The Letter, which we've spoken about, has been shown twice at COP27. Martin, we haven't shown it twice, but we had two episodes on it. <laughs> Hosted by the government of Senegal, the Holy See and the Laudato Si movement. The documentary is devoted to protecting and saving our common home. So, Martin, this is what is happening. And we just want to make it absolutely clear to the people that you cannot divorce and separate the Vatican from the issues that are taking place. Not at all. So, who is the beast? The Roman Catholic system. The Roman Catholic system, whether we like it or not. And now you've got another thing that you have to realize. P probably, well, 90% of the population of the earth 
don't know this is happening. Yes. So just because it is it doesn't seem to be a prominent news article all of this doesn't mean it is exactly what is b prophecy being fulfilled. Yes. All right. Breitbart, also November 2022. Pope Francis threatens climate crisis while decrying prophets of doom. I see he's wearing green. So he's become a greenie. Is <laughs> he <laughs> Kermit? The Pope sent out a series of mixed messages in his yearly homily for the World Day of the Poor. Again, you are isolating a group. You know, sin, does it only affect the poor? No. Does it affect the rich as well? Yeah. Are there many rich people in jail these days? No, only a select few that they want to make an example of. While well, those thousands that molested those 260,000 children are scot-free, right? Mm -hmm. mm, okay. So, selected groups spreading intense fear of possible climate change disasters, yet cautioning against prophets of doom, the sirens of populism and self-interested false messiahs. Let us light candles of hope in the midst of darkness, the pontiff urged. You know, Martin, when it comes to these things, like uh, their little rituals and their little light ceremonies and their candle ceremonies, I think it was Latimer that said to Master Ridley when they were going to be uh, burnt at the stake mm. for what they did, he said, you know, instead of propagating the light of the world, the papacy will propagate candles down with the word and up with the candles. candles. Yeah. So here we go. We're still in the same issue. Mm -hmm. So they light a candle and the light of the world and thy word is a lamp unto my feet that is extinguished. And if you, go, if you take um, the celebration of Diwali, festival of lights, yes, it's all, all candles about and things. lights, but that light of the world is nowhere to be seen. It's nowhere. Amid dramatic situations, let us seize opportunities to bear witness to the gospel of joy and to build a fraternal world, or at least a bit more fraternal. But that's a contradiction in terms, because that's a compromise with what the Bible condemns. In his 2021 message for the launching of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, Francis insisted that the current environmental situation calls us to act now with urgency. We have 10 years. Martin, is he a prophet? Well, or he knows something. Ah, maybe he knows a timeline. After all, he must be in communion with his boss, right? So he has 10 years to restore the ecosystem, which will mean the integral restoration of our relations with nature. This past week was replete with warnings from prophets of doom during the UN COP27 climate summit on Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Now, Martin, who are these prophets of doom? Well, I think we will probably qualify. qualify. Anybody who doesn't agree with this procedure or sees the pagan elements in it mm. must be a prophet of doom, right? Yeah. But let's just go to the Guardian and we'll see what they are saying over here. This is the United Nations. This is another very reputable source in the world today. So they think, world is on highway to climate hell. UN chief warns at COP27 summit. So Guterres told world leaders at the opening of the COP27 UN climate summit in Egypt on Monday, we are in the fight of our lives and we are losing and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. Well, you know, the rock band sang that, that we're on a highway to hell. Yeah. we <laughs> And the world celebrated. And how many drum sets did they have bashing yes, that I song can't. out at their gatherings? I can't remember. We've even showed, this is off topic again, but 
that it's even in cartoons, in, in animation films for kids. But yeah, that's a correct. Story. Okay, so we know that the world is on a highway to hell because the Bible says so. That's it. So we can sign a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact, he added. You know, I was just thinking now, th this is so <laughs> hilarious, actually. Because the Bible is telling us we're on a way to hell, a highway to hell, on a highway to climate hell with the plagues that will be falling. Yes. And this is humanity's push to try and block that. Yes, let's see how successful they are. So Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt, said in his opening address to the summit that poor and vulnerable people around the world were already experiencing the effect of extreme weather. But it's amazing. Only the poor and the vulnerable experience. Nobody else does. So obviously it must be very selective. This is a very wise climate change. The intensity and frequency of climate disasters has never been higher in all four corners of the world, bringing wave after wave of suffering for billions of people. Is it not high time today to put an end to the suffering? It riles me up because they're using things to push their agenda. Yes, and they're using emotional language. That's it. Because now people that talk against this, like us, seem unsensitive. Yes. towards people that's, uh, that are suffering as a consequence of a flood or disaster. But that's not the case. The thing is, they are using that to push an agenda for climate change. What do you have to do to fight climate change? And then comes the laws. Right. You might as well say, Martin, that cancer is ravaging the world, especially the vulnerable and the poor. Uh, is that, would that be a true statement? No, it would not be true. It's only that it seems that it's worse there because they don't have any means. So if you want to gain, gain sympathy, you make a statement like this. It falls in exactly the same category. Or motor accidents affect largely the poor. Yeah. Would no. that be true? No. Now let's look again at what Vatican News has to say. Pope encourages COP27. First he told them, now he encourages them. Recalls Laudato Si Action Platform University. Basically, what we are showing is, no matter what you do, you come back to his letter. <laughs> yeah. So the Pope also called the Laudato Si Action Platform, which was set up to consolidate efforts to implement the Pope's 2015 encyclical on the care of our common home. So just to make absolutely sure, does the Vatican have an agenda? Oh, definitely. And... In years gone by, like in the Middle Ages, they, if the Pope said this, he didn't say it so calmly. It was a command, and then it had to be done. But now it's just more subtle. It's but more it's still subtle. a command. It's still exactly the same thing. So we are showing a prophetic fulfillment. Is it happening? Definitely. Is he asking the kings of the world to give their power to his encyclical. If you, you can read it. How can you not see this? Are the kings of the world sitting on Mount Sinai willing to give him that authority and that recognition? Yes, you can just have a look at Kerry and Xi Jinping. He's actually, they're all part of this. So basically we can rest our case, right? All right, here's Earthbeat, a project of National Catholic Reporter, Earthbeat. These are all from November of this year. As COP27 talks stall, Catholics smash tablets, pray for divine intervention on Sinai. Martin, they don't have to smash the tablets. They've smashed them already. They just have to read... The Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you'll see that they've smashed them to smithereens. They're just enacting it symbolically. That's, that's so this is rather important, and we'll have to look at it in a little bit more detail. As dawn broke on the site where the Ten Commandments are believed to have been delivered to Moses, 
hundreds of Catholics, led by dozens of priests, knelt before the foot of the mountain. They prayed for world leaders at COP27 to submit to God's will. Uh, whose will? God's will. I thought it was the Pope's will, because well, he wants to implement his encyclical, right? So thousands of Catholics are praying that Laudato Si will be implemented. That's God's will, according to them. And fully commit to fighting climate change. Earlier that morning, climate activists smashed mock tablets of stone atop the mountain in reaction to world leaders' failure to follow through on commitments to mitigate and adapt to climate change. The act referenced the story in Exodus 32, when after descending Mount Sinai, an angry Moses smashed the Ten Commandments in protest against the Israelites worshipping other gods. Now, if they had the spirit of prophecy, they could read there that it was not a sin that Moses committed. No. It was a, basically a symbolic act of showing that the commandments had been broken. Mount Sinai is a sacred place. Uh, Martin, is that so? No. No. Something is sacred only if the presence of God is there. Yes. But when you have a pagan ritual on top of it, then you can be sure that God is not involved except as an observer. Mm -hmm. So Mount Sinai is a sacred place and our presence here is in search of communion with God who hears the cry of the poor, said Father Lennon Chetty, a member of the Society of Jesus in Southern Africa. So there we have another Jesuit. Martin, so if you have any riches, please don't pray because he won't hear you. This is again the selective language yeah. to create sympathy. We need those cries again and to be remissioned by the God of Joseph and Moses. Is that true, Martin? No, it's not true because we've got our mission already. We have our marching orders and our marching orders cannot be changed and neither can our commandments be changed. No. Damien Spruce, head of the advocacy of Caritas Australia, said the visit and prayers at Mount Sinai could convert the hearts of world leaders before the UN climate convening is scheduled to end on Friday. So who must accept this wave of propaganda? The leaders of the world. Yes. And then it must be put through to all humanity. Okay. Is that a fulfillment of prophecy that the powers must give their power unto the beast? Who is the doing the asking? Who do we read here is doing the asking or the informing? The church. Correct. So let's have a look at it from another perspective. The Times of Israel. Activists smash tablets atop Mount Sinai to launch faith-based climate push. So, an initiative to mobilize faith leaders worldwide to push governments to do more about climate change kicked off Sunday morning with an Israeli environmental activist smashing mock tablets of stone atop an Egyptian peak believed by many to be Mount Sinai to symbolize the world's failure to protect the planet. Now, if you look at those tablets, they were green, right? Mm -hmm. They were green. Funny stones. They must be full of moss. Mm -hmm. The Sinai Climate Partnership, symbolically launched at the ceremony, brings together the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, the Elijah Interfaith Institute. The names are fascinating to me. Hmm? Everything that they are talking about, like Elijah, has absolutely nothing to do with what is going on here. The Peace Department, wow. the United Nations Faith for the Earth Initiative, Abramovitz's Gigawatt Global. Martin, what do these names signify? That it's from all... It's business and faith and all coming together. And the Israeli environmental advocacy organizations. Martin, couldn't they have chosen longer terminology? <laughs> you were th saying that Elijah's got nothing to do with it, but maybe this is another Mount Carmel situation. Yes, but it's not Mount Sinai. <laughs> no. It's a Mount Carmel. Yes. 
After the group read from a new draft of the Ten Principles for Climate Repentance, formulated by dozens of multi-faith leaders, this is very important. Mm -hmm. This is a collective action. Meeting in London over the past few days, Abramovitz has smashed two tablets on the ground. Today, as faiths put aside their differences in a common call for climate action because they cannot agree on actions of salvation, we work towards a new covenant for mankind. Mm. Uh, Martin, what's wrong with the old one that Christ made with humanity? The problem is mankind couldn't keep it. Uh -huh. Why couldn't they keep it, Martin? Because they couldn't submit to Christ. They couldn't take him ah. as the all and everything. All it took was to open the door. Mm -hmm. No, they'd rather have this door because it's easier for them, right? And so uh, they want a new covenant for mankind. What did you want to no, say? I was just thinking when we did that one on the covenants, if you think, who was the one that every time initiated the covenant? God. Wh who is initiating it here? The Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Can it work? No. <laughs> Especially not for me. No. So they want a new covenant for mankind in the name of the protection of our common home. I thought the covenant that God made was to deal with the sin question. Yes. This is a totally new covenant. And for the betterment of our shared human future. What does the Bible say? It's going to get better or it's going to get worse? Worse and it's going to end. Hmm. So Martin... We have two totally different covenants, two totally different mindsets. So here is the Elijah Interfaith Institute YouTube channel. Let's have a look how they depict what happened at Mount Sinai. <laughs> A group of about 50 world religious leaders has been working on these spiritual principles for climate repentance. We're going to enter this in a prayerful spirit, so what we're going to do is the following. We will be led by sounds, silence, and our... Sp After that, there's time to talk and to share. But we're going to start by having a moment of silence. Then we're going to sound the conch. Conch is a Hindu sign of auspiciousness, blessing, beginning. We'll begin with the conch. Then the bell will sound between each of the ten principles to be read from the scrolls that everyone is holding in his hand. And bell after each principle, it's a moment of silence for all those gathered here. Even if you didn't know you're capable of being silent, you're going to learn that today. And then after that moment of silence, the bell will ring again, the next principle we read, till we get to the end. And then we conclude with the sound of the shofar, which is the analogous to the to the conch uh, sound produced from a natural from, from, from a ram's horn, which in Jewish tradition is a call for repentance. And therefore, we conclude this part of the repentance ceremony with the sound of the shofar. <laughs> and a call to return to a true vision of the creation, the creator, and the harmonious relationship of humanity with creation. Therefore, use thought, speech, and action only for the good. Therefore, act knowing that every action counts. Martin, I hope God heard all of those things because maybe he was sleeping 
Maybe he was on a little journey somewhere. Uh, we don't have to go through the entire list that Elijah mentioned, but uh, you know, I just thought if you go to Luke, for example, and you turn to Luke chapter 20, where from verse 45, Jesus says the following. And it's interesting, then in the audience of all the people, mm, mm. he said unto his disciples. So this is something that Jesus wanted everyone to hear. Because it says, in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and in the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms of the feasts which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. It's a terrible verse to quote under these circumstances. But pomp and ceremony has always been part of paganism. Humble prayer and submission to God mm. is out of fashion, Martin. It is true. This is a, if you take the whole story of Elijah, I, I don't think it was many, much different than what we've just seen. It's, a, it's exactly the same thing. So from this announcement, these various leaders of these various uh, movements with the very long integral names, then representing this issue, went to the top of the mountain. Let's see what happened there. Welcome to the summit of Mount Sinai. I am David Mirrod Wapner, Chair of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. We have ascended the mountain on behalf of our partners in the Sinai Climate Partnership, the Peace Department led by James Sternlich, the Elijah Interfaith Institute under the direction of Rabbi Elon Goshen Gottstein, Faith for Earth, the Faith for Earth Initiative and the United Nations Environment Program, and the Israel Union of Environmental Defense and the Rodberg Foundation from Canada. And the Christian Climate Observers Program, who we have met up here on Mount Sinai. We are here at Mount Sinai, a place of historic revelation, a holy spot to the three Abrahamic faiths. At the same time, the world's political and civil society leaders gather south of here at Sharm el Sheikh for the UN FCC COP27. We're here to kick off a global spiritual call to action on climate justice, with being held at 10 different mountaintops around the world, culminating in a first-of-its-kind ceremony of repentance for climate justice in London later on today. So, um, these tablets are already a little bit broken. They were they were made by the Strike for Fridays um, teenagers, and in Hebrew it says, "Keep your promises, which are not being kept by the world leaders." <laughs> the whole world needs to cut our emissions by half by 2030, and they're not yet. We take these green commandments. We look down to Sharm el Sheikh and we're not satisfied. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, Martin, not only on that mountain, but on ten mountains. Could we say those are high places? I was thinking the same thing. So they're having their little ceremonies on all the high places. Now, why ten, Martin? Because there's ten commandments. There's ten commandments and ten regions of the world. Ten seems to be a very important number. So, Martin, what are all these principles that they are talking about? Let's just look at them. And uh, this year comes from climaterepentance.com. Now, Martin, 
repentance from sin has moved to repentance from climate. That's just how ridiculous it's gotten. It's, it's that and rid- it's not a, a, a little subliminal movement. No, it's massive. <laughs> So the 10 spiritual principles for climate repentance. God and the world, the nature of being. We recognize human responsibility to love and protect nature. We must treat all of life with reverence. Martin, why do they have selective groups then? We must care for each other and the planet. Now, Martin, this all sounds fine. So... uh, You know, it's a morsel that people will be able to consume. Then humanity and its responsibilities, commitment to not harm creation and the responsibility to protect it, commitment to serve, advance, and aid the growth and evolution of all parts of creation. Martin, can you agree with that one? No. No? No. What's wrong with you? (laughs) A disciplined spiritual life is helpful in overcoming the challenges of climate change. Use thought, speech, and action only for the good. Well, with a fallen nature and without Christ, let's see how far we get. The human person is benefited by the ongoing effort to purify, raise, and transform himself in view of a higher vision. Mm. Martin, is that possible in terms of Christianity? Not without God. No. To transform himself, this is new age to the T. Mm -hmm. Living in spirituality and responsibility. Uh, Martin, you can be very spiritual and still have no faith in the God of the Bible. Act knowing that every action counts. We adopt a mindful and attentive view of the natural world. Be sensitive to the intolerable insecurities and injustices in which so many of our fellow humans live. That is their sentimental chord. So when you go and look at the Georgia Guidestones that have been removed by explosive means also smashed or something. so they were also symbolically smashed right but they've actually been replaced mm-hmm. and they're still there because R.C. Christian who apparently wrote it is very active on Mount Sinai the Roman Catholic Church as we have seen is very active the R.C. Christian on Sinai So what did the Georgia Guidestones say? Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. So So the other 7.5 billion must stop breathing because they're contributing CO2. Yeah. So actually, the first one year in the Guidestones is also related to climate. It's related to climate. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. So again, you have an interference with God's plan that said multiply. That's it. Don't the climate activists have the same thing going? The, uh, saying that the, who's the problem? Humanity is the problem because we're overpopulated in all of this? Yes. Unite humanity with a living new language. Who separated the languages? God. Who wants to bring them together? The devil. The devil. But what is the new language? It's already there. Climate change. Climate. 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 Rule, passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Mm. Reason informed by faith or faith informed by reason. Jesuit thinking, we've discussed that on many, many occasions. This is a Jesuit document. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Well, Martin, if they succeed in doing that on this earth, (laughs) then I will be more than slightly surprised. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. That's asking for one world government. 
Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Well, start with yourselves. Well, I just want to go to, to number six again. So what is COP and United Nations? It's actually doing that already. Disputes, resolving disputes in a world court or this, but it's not a world, it's not a court. But that's what they're trying to do with COP and this, get all the disputes together for one deciding organization that decides not only your morality, but your actions as well. Oh, makes me think of the World Health Organization. Don't even go there, Martin. <laughs> Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize, well, this is pure climate change. That's it. Prize, truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Martin, you shall have no other gods besides me. And do not be like the pagans who think they will be heard because of their repetitive prayers. Well, if you take the course of the infinite, what about the Mother Earth situation that you've got now? So you have to get in harmony and beauty and love with Mother Earth. And be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. Is this climate change? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So the Georgia Guidestones have been replaced by a new set of rules. So let's have a look what BBC News has to say. Georgia Guidestones, American Stonehenge, demolished after a blast. Well, it seems to be a lot of symbolism involved. So I wonder who blew them up. Has there been any prosecution? No. No. So whoever blew them up is not a problem. So it must be part of the solution. You see, we've, I think we mentioned this before. You've got a few... As, um, aspects going here. People, it could have been blown up to get more attention towards it, and it could have. Been, and now you've got the other side who are glad it's blown up, but there's still. It's like we've just mentioned. It's going still forward in just another in meet. another form, form. in a, totally another form. All right, Martin. So we see that there really isn't much difference in the sentiment of the documents that they have produced. But the fact is, they wrote them on two tablets. And they were green. So they are new. They are new criteria for humanity, mm -hmm. which the Georgia Guidestone says all humanity, for the sake of social cohesion, should comply with. Make room for nature. Make room for nature is how they end. Mm. So it's the same sort of sentiment, the same driving force. And we can be pretty sure that the Jesuits have their finger in the pie. Mm. So Martin, when it comes to the culling of humanity, uh, irrespective of what means are used for reaching that goal, and whether they want to introduce Noahide laws and all of these things, let's wait for the future to unfold mm. before we mm. say anything more about that. Now, Martin, what we really have to talk about is the contrast between these laws that they have created, which are very vague. Yes. They're very vague. And very specific laws that God gave on Mount Sinai. How does God feel about his law? It's, that's so important. And just to bring in as well, remember, these laws have ensconced in it, maybe in darkness, something that will be implemented. That we'll we get to, to that. Martin, I think if we want to know how God feels about his law, it might be a good idea to go to the psalm that was written with these laws of God specifically. And of course, I'm referring to the longest psalm in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Yes. The longest psalms in the Bible. The one that, that, that deals with the law of God is the longest in the Bible. Correct. And I don't want to go through the whole thing. But we certainly can highlight a few thoughts out of it. Because, number one, when you read Psalms 119, and you think that there are religious systems that will take such a sublime concept as we, as we have here, 
and say that it has been done away with. That is like saying that the most precious thing that God has on which his government is based has been done away with. God has decided that his law is useless. Yeah. After singing the most sublime song in its favor, it is so yeah. ridiculous. So if we read it, then we must bear in mind that it also has messianic overtones because the embodiment of the law we find it in an individual yeah. in Jesus Christ in Jesus, yeah. and I know we've been a little bit facetious and uh, even sarcastic but uh, let me Justify by saying Elijah did the same on Mount Carmel when it came to the truth. That's it. We are not supposed to be sarcastic when it comes to people and individual, where you hurt individual feelings. But when it comes to nonsense like this, then you really have to distance yourself from it. And I would like to say, mm. any organization that willingly takes part in these rituals is taking part in a pagan ritual and honoring the God of Ekron That's it. and not the God of the Bible, irrespective of what religious system come, it comes from, even from our own. Yeah. It shows a complete lack of understanding of the difference between paganism and the worship of the true God. That's true. And everybody that's affected by this or let's say indoctrinated, we feel sorry for them. Yes, just as we, for them. we want them also. God help them. But how many Israelites were on the Baal side of the issue on Mount Carla? The Carmel. majority. The majority. So we can expect that there will be maybe even a majority that has swallowed this nonsense hook, line, mm -hmm. and sinker. So let us not uh, write off the system because after Elijah had done his work, they did say, the true God is the God of the Bible. So blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. The law and the testimony. The law referred to is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which includes the commandments, and they will be highlighted in the psalm mm. as well. So blessed are they that have the law and the testimony. The testimony is the word of the prophets yeah. throughout the Bible. That's the testimony because they testify to the accuracy of, and the correctness and the fullness of the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible. So, blessed are they. And this prophetic gift includes whatever a prophet said, whether he's part of the canon or not. True. What Hulda said, what uh, the daughters of Philip said, what any prophet said is part of the testimony including the testimony of the remnant. That's it. All of it. Blessed are you if you walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. That is the issue. To the law, says Isaiah, mm -hmm. and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Is there any mention of any of this law on Mount Sinai? No. Therefore, there's no light in it. Nothing. No matter how many candles they light, mm -hmm. it's still darkness. That's why they have to light it, because there's only darkness. Yes. Oh, that my ways, verse 5, were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. This is the basis of what we are reading here. It says in verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I may not sin against thee. The issue is sin, Martin. And the issue of sin has to do with salvation because it costs the price. It costs the price of the Son of God. 
So all of these things are incredibly important. If we drop down to verse 32, it says, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. So when you understand God's principles and his government and his commandments, will it make you narrow and bigoted, as the Pope says, or will it enlarge your heart? So a natural cause of you keeping the commandments is that you will love your neighbor. Okay. So verse 34 says, Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Hmm. Will you get a greater understanding when you keep God's commandments? You'll have a heart condition. Okay. Will it include portions of humanity or all of humanity? The, no, all. Christ died only for a few, right? Yep, for all. Oh, he died for all. Isn't that interesting? Verse 45 says, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. So is the, is the law binding you and uh, narrowing your path, or is it liberating? Yep. Setting you free. My hands also, verse 48, also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. So Martin, it shifts from one sphere to the other. Verse 53 says, Horror has taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. So Martin, when you see this kind of thing and you see a new covenant that has nothing mm. to do with the covenant of God but is made with something that cannot see, smell, or hear. It's horror. It, you must be horrified. Yeah. Can you take part in this sort of activity? Now, verse 71 is to me a very interesting one, or verse 70. The heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Does God teach us something through the troubles of life? Every one is a lesson. Okay. Now, where does the most pain come from in the world? Isn't it because of transgression of the law? Mm -hmm. Take marriage. Infidelity in marriage. Does it cause happiness or does it cause pain? No, it's heartache. Hmm? What about any of the other commandments? Any any of the commandments being broken causes are you, heartache. Are you going to be happy by using stolen goods? No. Are you going to be happy if you stab your neighbor in the, in the back? You're never going to be happy, Martin. So, if we drop to 97, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies. Martin, what do you make of that? That's Wisdom it. is bound up with the law and yeah. with the Ten Commandments. That's it. And so, so God took them away because so, he wants you to be unwise. So how much wisdom do you have in, this, in something like this? None. Zero. Zero. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. Martin, if the remnant would take that to heart, they wouldn't be sitting on Mount Car Carmel lighting little candles and shouting for joy. Yeah. They wouldn't do that. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. Martin, how important is it that we let God teach us the way? And how does he teach it? Hmm? He teaches it through the commandments. Okay. Verse 105. This is the best known verse in the whole of the Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do we not sing that song? Mm -hmm. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. I'm not going to sing. I'm going to chase everybody <laughs> away. But You're going to have requests now. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, this is where truth lies. Martin, this is deep stuff. 
This is, this is food for the soul. And then if we go to verse 115, or oh, first 111, thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage for how long, Martha? Forever. Ah. Thy testimonies, that which the prophet has said, they have predicted that this would happen. Mm -hmm. And we look right past it and take part in it. Or verse 115, depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Depart from me. Any transgression of the law or making a new covenant that is not based on the law is something that you want to depart from. Verse 130 tells me that the entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. You will not be able to discern if you are not rooted in the scriptures. No wonder the Jesuits call this a poisonous asp. It's amazing if you take the commandments, can a child understand them? Everybody can understand it. But why don't they want it? Because they cling to sin. Verse 165, it's another one of these wonderful verses. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So the, no fear, no anxiety. Nothing of this nature. Hmm? Martin, when you read this kind of thing, great peace have they which love thy law. All thy commandments are truth, Martin. Verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. If you want to have truth, then listen to what God said and not to what some greenie had to no. say. And if you bring it back, the truth shall set you free. We've just read earlier that the law is liberating. Yes, and the commandments are truth. So... The truth will set you free. So what will set you free? The truth. The commandments. <laughs> and who is the embodiment of the commandments? Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And thy word is truth. truth. Now look how this psalm ends. This is amazing. Verse 171. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. Mm. In other words, when will you really honor God? When you understand and take up his statutes. When did I laws. change my life from a pagan atheist, occultist, to a believer? When you started implementing the Ten Commandments. When in I was your life. confronted with the Ten Commandments yeah. and saw myself as a sinner. Your mirror. Hmm? And so it says over here in verse 172 My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Verse 174, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. If you separate the law from your religion, you end up here. That's it. If you separate the law from your religion, then you become a pagan. <laughs> so a lot of Christianity today is nothing other than paganism. I think that's a very good sum summarizing that you've just put there. You cannot separate salvation from the law. No. So if you read verse 174 again, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Verse 176, the final verse says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Martin, Martin, that's food. That's food for the soul. This no. is junk food. This fast we food. have to look upon with horror. So where are they heading? And why mm. is it important for them to implement these things? It's about authority. That's it. What is the law of authority? The fourth commandment. The fourth commandment. Psychology Today, October 6, 2022. Resilience, the Sabbath, and the planet.
So what is resilience? Resilience is about recovery. Recovery is a physiologic phenomenon. The Sabbath, a day of religious observance and abstinence from work, is really much more than just the abstinence from work in devotion to a God. It's interesting that he writes that with a capital G when he says a hey, God. Very interesting. The Sabbath included time for rest, time for feasting, time for communing, time for spiritual connection, and time for faith. The concept of a Sabbath, an assurance that at least once a week we get to move into safety, physiology to heal, be healthy and well, is one of recovery and therefore resilience. A Sabbath or sabbatical need not have a religious connotation. A secular Sabbath is as valid as a religious one. Spiritual connection and a sense of faith can be found within safety, with or without the belief in the constructs of a religion. As we give time to ourselves for a Sabbath and sabbatical to build our resilience, we can also give time to our planet for regeneration, rejuvenation, recovery, and resilience. So the point here, Martin, mm -hmm. is that the Bible says that the mark of the beast will be in the forehead or the hand. So if you have a spiritual connection, then you are convicted that it has a spiritual mm -hmm. meaning, and therefore you accept it, then you receive the mark of the beast. If you have no spiritual connection, you are just doing it for the sake of validity and getting physiological or relief. Or the planet. Or the planet. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you get it on your hand, yeah. because yeah. you're doing it. Mm -hmm without any spiritual reason. So can the secular world and the religious world unite on this? We've seen it now, definitely. Okay. During the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the amazing resilience of our planet from just one month of near total shutdown of human activity. So the planet got a rest, Martin, because everybody was on lockdown. So humanity... Is the problem. We're the problem and not the volcano. These concepts of resilience, recovery, safety, and a Sabbath are not based in philosophy or religion, but in physiology and biology. So the body needs it, right? Now, when he talks about a Sabbath, I think he's quoting the NIV there instead of the Sabbath, but let's leave it at that. Can we create a cultural contagion, a meme? of a respected secular Sabbath? Dare we save ourselves with this medicine of a day off? Martin, a secular Sabbath? That sounds like Sunday to me. That's a secular Sabbath. That's because it. it's definitely not the biblical one, no. which is the seventh day. And in any case, that will be perfect for the secular world to do it for whatever reason, okay. climate change. Did the Pope ask for a day? Yeah. Did he put it in Laudato Si? Yes. Did he ask for implementation? No, he actually commanded it. All right, he commanded implementation of a respected secular Sabbath. But what if it is a false Sabbath, Martin? Then it boils down not to the day, but to authority. That's it. And let's end it with that, because whose authority is paramount in my life? I just read in Psalms 119, whose authority I am willing to accept. I'm not willing to accept the authority of a usurper who has a new set of commandments, a new covenant, and a respected secular Sabbath. Um, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the world is on a precipice. They're standing on ten high places. And they want to make a Carmel decision, which, according to them, must this time round go the other way. But as for me and my house, Lord, we want to go the way of the truth and the life, which can be only found in the law and the testimony and the one who embodies it, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.